So the first thing is, uh, if somebody wants to learn the Java very first time after completion of the graduation or master's or anything, then the, the first question should arise in mind is why I should consider a Java, learning Java. So this is basically the Java is uh, application, I mean Java programming language is developed by Sun Microsystems and later on acquired by Oracle Corporation. So Oracle itself is uh, giving some reasons why I should consider learning Java. So they mentioned clearly in their blog. So they are just giving many reasons and even personally also I can give many reasons why I should uh, learn Java, considering, consider learning Java. So the first and foremost thing is uh, everybody, first of all, I mean, uh, I just want to become a developer. I just I want to learn a programming. So I look out the market and what is up, what is the trend is going on. So which programming language is very popular? So there are many reasons why we look for the programming language, popular programming language, because that programming popular programming language can only give the employment options. So here is. Uh, if I go, uh, I mean, uh, I just want to mention only, I mean, is there are only, uh, there are many reasons, but though it's uh, it's not possible to give all the reasons, so, but I just keep it as, as many reasons as possible in this presentation. So, there are slides I mentioned, and every slide is, uh, gave them many reasons, and I've also mentioned a couple of URLs where you could get uh, uh, more information about, uh, learning Java and why you, should, why you should consider learning Java. So if I go slide by slide, the, the first slide is uh, it talks about uh, uh, is, I mean, uh, the popular programming language. So what do you mean by a popular programming language? Popular programming language in the sense is, uh, so I mean, if, if many people are using the same language to develop the applications and many industries something like that. So that becomes a popular language. So a couple of companies conducted a survey. So one of them is IO, uh, <coughs> TIOBE is uh, conducted a survey in February 2006 and IEEE Spectrum Ranking is also conducted a survey and they gave a ranking to the Java as a popular programming language. So Java holds the title as a popular, most popular programming language. So, and the second reason is pay matters. What do you mean by pay matters? So, I mean, being a developer, what what benefits I get? So, the first thing is I think about that, okay, I'm just going to learn the Java. So, learning the Java is that does it provide me bread and butter every day? So, these are the kind of questions. Is it going to be good, giving me the good life? I mean, living economically, does it support me? And all those questions uh, come in my mind. So, for that reason, so the pay matters is uh, the repo, repo the, I mean, the couple of companies have been conducted a business service and the pop publications, and they confirm that the Java skills, having a Java skills on your resume is a very good. Out. So, it's a reports confirm that Java programmers are among the highest paid programmers in the industry. So, the analysis is done by the Quartz and a global digital business news publication. It's convinced it's a lucrative to have a Java skills on your resume. And career planning company Goro also indicates that the Java remains one of the most popular and best paying language in the US, UK and Australia in its uh, 2015 salary sentiment report. And uh, the, the job search engine indeed uh, also conducted an uh, employment related search engine is a listing the average Java developer, how much is earning as an average, average Java developer? So the amount is $102,000 in US according to their February 2016 reports. That's a huge amount. So that's a, these are the two things. Uh, the first is Java is very popular and the second is pay matters. And the third one is, and so there are many reasons. So the third one is, if I go to the third slide, and you see that the Java programmers are employable. So as I said, if the Java is very popular in the industry, and the Java has been used by many industries, so that's become so that's a reason if you have any Java programming skills, 
it is a possible high possibility that you could place anywhere because it's a widely used language and install large install base. So that's how the third point is it supports you to why you should consider learning a Java. And the Java is everywhere. So the, the current estimation is that Java is running on 3 billion devices worldwide. That's a huge list. So 3 billion devices. So it's basically Java lets you to create any program that works anywhere. So you could develop a smart program, smart applications, and smartphones, and servers, ATMs, point of sale, and Blu-ray players, television, set-up boxes, internet of things, gateways, medical devices, and finally readers, automation. So if you want to really see whether the Java program is really uh, used in a real application, simply you can just open your uh, smartphone and go to the Google Play and just search for any app. So there are so many apps that are coming every day and you can uh, daily in the market. So that means there are so many opportunities if you want to learn the Java. So there is a possible, uh, there is a high possibility that you could get an employment. So once you get employment, then it's a, it's a dead by default. I mean, just say it's an, it provides an, uh, salary and everything, right? So that's how it is uh, Java. Is. So and the real world applications, as I said, I mean, it's a smartphone you can e is using. And there's also not only smartphones, the big sites like e-commerce website, eBay.com. And Amazon is another e-commerce website. And the Facebook is a social site. These are these all these sites are used in Java. So they develop Java and the Java is also not only this. Initially Java is developed for embedded systems. So the Java concept initially was the Vora. Write once and run anywhere. That's a concept that you can take up with the name to develop this language. So you know, you don't need to depend on any operating system. So you just develop it in a, I mean, I mean, I mean to say that if you develop an application on a Windows system, you could simply deploy it in the Linux operating system and run that program. So it's a Java is in a completely platform independent. So that's how it gives an advantage for this programming language and that's the reason it becomes very popular. And Java is an ideal for IoT. So Internet of Things. Internet of Things, you could do a lot of things. Like, like basically, you could just provide services uh, virtually rather than physically. I mean to say that uh, IoT thing. For example, uh, you could develop application for a smart application. Or you could develop the defensive search as a NASA. And, uh, and you could just attend a, uh, you could make any virtual calls with a doctor. And you could de develop any uh, devices uh, for the tracking. You can track the patient or you can track the vehicle, transport vehicle. Or you could, you could just track your shipment or anything. You just develop the applications. So all those applications you could develop with the Java simply. So very easily. And and that's uh, these are the things. And also there are other reasons like uh, why Java is a, Java is a so Java is actually basically, there are so many, Java is also very strong even, even uh, uh, O'Reilly Corporation itself is committed with strongly to the Java towards the road, with the road map. So they are planning to release the, even right now we have a Java version 8, but they are also planning to release a Java 9. So the Java 9 targeted for September 2006 actually, but that not yet released, uh, but today we are in May 2017. I don't know there are no news about this, but uh, maybe still. So in that Java 9, there are a lot of uh, enhancements for the security and performance, and they were, they plan to modernize the versions of the Java SM9. So and Java is also is uh, uh, developing. It's, this Java is basically very uh, useful to developing the enterprise applications. It's virtually in the industry. So financial services like very big banks. Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, uh, Citibank, and other big banks for JPMC, they all are using Java to develop their uh, trading applications, backend applications, and the frontend applications, back office applications, and trading applications. That's how Java is uh, been used everywhere. 
So as I said, the Java has been using in a smartphone, servers, ATMs, and point of sale terminals, new database. So it's a wide variety of uh, places we are using Java. So that ensures that you get an employment easily if once you learn the Java. So right now it's a very high demand for the Java. So and the next is Java has a staying power. As I said, is the Java recently celebrated 20th birthday. So, so Java is actually the, the initial development started in 1991 and then in the 96 they released the first version and since then 2016 was the 20th birthday for the Java. So and there is one more reason. So there are so many programming languages coming into the market and they just keep disappearing in after the, down the road in a few years. So nobody wants to learn that language and they keep a mark and they stay in the market for only a few years, right? So if somebody wants wants to learn the Java program, I mean somebody wants to learn a program, programming language, they want to stay in the market forever. So that's how they are going to earn their everyday bread and butter. So that's the main important thing. The first thing is that Java is just, uh, they released their different versions at different times in the last 20 years. So that's the one reason. And that is a Java is also tools are available for this Java too. So if you want to develop any programming, uh, any application using Java, that's very easy because there are so many tools available for that. So you could develop some of the code using a popular uh, developer tools called NetBeans and Eclipse, something like that. There's a, a great examples for that. As I said, they help you to develop an integrated development environment space, IDEs. So these are, using these IDEs, you could develop the Java program simply rather than writing a notepad and compiling using command line or something like that. Instead of that, you could just do it, you write a program and simply compile it and should, uh, run it the program from the IDE itself. That's how it's a Java is very popular and it's, in a, it's providing in a different tools. And Java community is also very big. If you just go and search uh, about the Java in Google, you see that lot of uh, search resources come. So that's how it's very easy to, even if you struck with uh, any programming question or anything, that is easy to get the answer from the web. So you just go and paste it uh, your uh, uh, issue, then there are so many developers. I mean, as far as the estimation is, uh, 9 million Java developers are working currently in uh, worldwide, worldwide. So that gives an, a, it's a vibrant and active community that works together and post a growth is a powerful program. So even if I have a question and if you don't know what, what to do with the programming, something like that. So you could easily learn by just posting your uh, uh, question in any of the Java community website. So you get immediately help from those guys. So there are so 9 million people at Java developers working with that they're looking, keep on looking at if somebody is asking any questions. So you could join one of the community and just keep on uh, post your questions, you get answers. That's how also you can learn Java, it's very easy. So and the other reasons is, uh, is a, as I said, there's a strong map and Java 9 is they're planning to release. Uh, they actually, they plan to put, uh, in release in September 2016, but they haven't released. So the Java 9 that are coming, that is going to be coming the modularized and platform while improving the security and performance. And Java has a whole leading developer applications. So as I said, there are 9 million developers are working, but not all the people have the same skill set. Some of the Java developers is works in a smarter way and some of them do a hard work and some of them do struggle. So, but when you are learning a Java, if you if you learn the Java in depth, then only you will be top up on other programmers. So for that also, how what what uh, is there any certifications for that? Yes, Oracle is providing a different levels of certificates to ensure that you know the Java and you eat this guy is like the in-depth Java. So there are three kinds of certifications that I know is uh, Oracle is providing. One is uh, Oracle Certified Associate. That's in a basic uh, knowledge about Java. So once you complete this uh, OCA, Oracle Certified Association certification, then you're allowed to write another test called Oracle Certified Program. So programmer is nothing but it just is going to test more advanced skill set. So once you pass that exam, then you will be in a Oracle Certified Program. So once you, are, once you become an Oracle Certified Programmer, if you just put on that certification on your resume and just 
go and apply to any applicants. Employer thinks that, okay, this guy is uh, certified by Oracle. That means he learned the Java in depth. So even if I give an employment to this guy, he's in a position short with any application, with a minimal guidance or without any guidance, something like that. So that's how it is, uh, the certification provides. So there is also one more certification, web developer. And that's uh, actually related to web technologies or at least provide. And component developer. If you want to develop the business components, there is a component developer. And the later on uh, in the career, so there is an architect. Architect is also Java certified architect. Or certified architect. So all the Java programming that you learn the Java and you should be top of that. Every time if you learn the technology, then you should learn in depth. Not learning that Java is not sufficient to be day to day programming. So there are other blogs is uh, mentioned here is, uh, I mean, I just gathered the complete information for you guys. So why you should consider Java. There are other things also. It's not only Java, it's as I said, it's the financial industries and uh, uh, e-commerce websites and other sites. So they are using it in the NASA also. So it's the NASA, is the National Aeronautic, uh, Aeronautics and Space Administration uses of the Java in a number of interesting applications. So the recent favorite was is a whirlwind, a software development kit that lets zoom in from the outer space and examine any location on the earth. That's what they develop. That's a great application, very good application. So that's how you can just imagine, okay, so if you come up with some idea, then just simply you can just see, develop that, that just put it into the technology and develop that idea. Take that idea and just develop it in application with that. That's all. So you can use simply Java for that. So there are radar technologies and all these things you can develop it. And not only that, in the I would, as I said, I would ease. So the Internet of Things is uh, IT coders may not be away. IoT products actually may not be all that exciting, but the interesting thing is creating your own device is always very interesting, right? So if you create your own product and you just feel that, oh, I did just develop this for using Java technology. That's all this gives immense uh, satisfaction for any people. The main focus of the products such as Sunspot is help the developers to embrace the embedded technologies. And, and it's a designing the even that's not the future is only just for these applications and they're using the uh, Java to develop the robot designing the robots for the future. So robot also ro to develop the robot to design the robots and also they're using the Java. And not only that, so earlier what we used to do is if you want if the doctor is supposed to visit a patient's house and give them medication or something. But using a Java, we just, just developed an application that now it becomes a virtual. That means doctor can sit in his office and take the patient, attend the patient in his patient's house through a video online chart or video phone. So they just suggest and they just give the medications. And the face-to-face -face charting and face-to-face -face call. So that's how it's, so these all these are applications is developed by using Java. So and the large scale applications also. Uh, recently, I heard about that the Twitter is also moved to a good part of its application to from the Ruby and uh, Rails to the Java, actually, because of the Java is very popular and it provides a very scalability and the performance. So for that reason, most of the applications have been moving from the other platforms to this Java platform, this is Java programming language. And uh, it's, it's a Java is used for the cloud computing. So they are moving, a, they are developing a new applications in the cloud computing, not only de developing, and there are also more the existing applications called cloud computing. What exactly the cloud computing? The cloud computing is nothing but is sharing the space in the cloud. So somebody provides a space, you just purchase a space and install it rather than having it in their own local server and all this. You can just install your app on the servers and that's all. So you will be all set for that. That's that's how it's just developing the applications. And Android apps we said. So even, not only that, even the movies, the movies also they are using Java to develop smart uh, things. So for that they are actually using a Java FX, desktop graphics uh, graphics package. So they are using to develop the uh, applications and uh, games also. Even if you look at the games, there are so many games available in that, right? 
So those are the data sets also developed using the Java FX graphics so, uh, packages. And there are so many reasons actually. So not only these reasons what I have mentioned. So you just go and simply search yourself and you just get a lot of articles. So why you need to consider, why you should consider learning Java. There are so many reasons. So after considering all this, so once you decided to learn the Java, okay, you may get another question that, okay, I learned the Java, now I just Java developer. What is that my career path is going to be? So your career path is mostly looking like this. So this is a basic and it's a typical way of, it may or may not be followed by company, but usually so this is the way. Once you become a Java developer, so the next level would be a software engineer and after that senior software and C software developer and you become a web developer. So it, it keep on, it goes like that. So or you can if you choose the second one is a Java developer and software developer and software engineer, senior software engineer and programmer analyst. The third one is Java developer, developer, programmer, program analyst, senior program analyst, Java developer, programmer, programmer. Companies follow this typical standards and they just give in a and every designation, whatever the designation, you get it. So you have a key sent responsibility, key responsibility for the associated with that role. So you have to perform and once you perform this and you get that promoted to the next level, so that's always you have to do a So right now, say for example, you learn the Java today and uh, tomorrow you buy an opportunity with one company. So you may ask me the question that uh, where you want me to see myself is in the next five years. Either you could become a senior programmer analyst or programmer analyst or senior software. It completely purely depends on your performance, how you perform in that company. So it depends on how you impress your manager or your outfit or your colleagues. It purely depends on. Some people may get an SC and become a programmer analyst within a five years. So for some people it takes uh, 10 years to become a programmer analyst. Some people it takes more than that. Something like that. It depends on your performance. So, in order to perform a better way in the program, in in projects, you need to learn each and every concepts of the job. So that's how is a is a career path. And okay, uh, let us consider the next level of this is. Uh, so we'll start, uh, okay, once you decided to learn the Java, then we need to learn the, from the start from the JVM basically. So this JVM is a, the first thing is, so, we should aware of the JVM uh, architecture actually. This is the structure of internal architecture of the JVM. So that, uh, so there are actually JVM, so once you write the Java file, so using a Java C compiler, you compile the Java file into a class file. So here is a good thing is that every, actually once you become a Java developer, most of the developers is not showing interest to learn the JVM architecture. They don't care. They just simply uh, concentrate on the programming and they just write the programs and compile it and run it. But they don't know how the program compiles and runs actually. So if you understand the JVM architecture, then only you can write the code very efficient. That's very important. So every Java developer should know that the bytecode, uh, every Java developer knows about the bytecode will be executed by JI, which is a Java runtime system. So but many uh, developers, as I said, is uh, doesn't know the fact that JR is an implementation of Java Virtual Machine. That is called JVM. Here is a JVM, is a Java Virtual Machine. So this JVM is basically analyzes the byte code. The byte code is uh, how the byte code is created. Is when you compile the Java file into cluster, it gets a byte code. So this byte code is analyzed by uh, JVM and interprets the code and executes. So, and for that actually, so for the JVM has a different components in the JVM itself. So, what is the JVM is basically Java virtual machine. What is a virtual machine? Virtual machine is nothing but is a Java virtual machine is nothing but is an, uh, it's a software implementation for the physical machine. 
So as I said earlier, it's a Java is developed using a concept called Aura. That's in the right once and run anywhere. So this is virtual machine is not related to any operating system. This is an independent virtual machine. It's a software implementation for the physical machine, but though it is a, it has its own architecture. So that once you write the Java file and once you compile it to the class file, and your class file is given to the this JVM. So the JVM has a three sub components. The first one is class loader subsystem. And the second one is runtime data areas. The third one is execution engine. Now we'll see how it is have how it goes to the different systems. So once you give the class file to the class loader subsystem, there again the class loader subsystem is divided into three phases. That is a loading and linking and initialization. So what happens in the during the loading phase? Loading phase again divided into three phases. One is a bootstrap class loader and the extension class loader and the application class loader. So what exactly that happens in the during the uh, this class loading function? The bootstrap loader, what exactly the boot class bootstrap class loader does? So once you install the Java on your desktop, if you just open it, uh, uh, you uh, actually sorry to disturb. It's a, are you seeing that? Uh, so you get the structure like if you install default to the C drive, then you get a structure like program files and Java. And if you just go to the JRE here, and if you just open the lib, and there is a jar called rt.jar. So this rt.jar, this is the runtime jar. So if you just open this, there are so many jars inside that. There are classes inside this rt.jar. So all these classes will be loaded by bootstrap class loader. This is that this is how it starts first from there. And then the bootstrap class loader is responsible to load all the rt related rt.jar file. Whatever the jar class files we mentioned inside a jar file, it loads all those uh, class files in order to run your program. And the second one is extension class loader. Extension class loader is look into the ext folder. So in the same location jre lib and we have an ext folder. It loads all the class files inside this jars. You can just open the jar and see what are the class files. So all those uh, class files are required in order to run your program. So this is the second level up in there during the loading. And a third one is application class loader. Application class loader is basically once you uh, install the application uh, Java. So if you go to your computer and uh, and you just open in properties, there you could see that uh, where you configure your Java, how you configure. It. That's the environment. If you go to the environment variable section, if you say here is the environment variable section, and you see the path here, the system variables. You go to the path is to see where I get Java and Java. This is my path actually. This is where I installed it for I can Java. So from there it loads the, the last level class files. All the classes required for the program. That's how is the, the first phase of the loading phase. So the loading phase is in a bootstrap class loader and extension class loader and application class loader. And this loading is actually part of the delegation hierarchy algorithm. Uh, what do you mean by delegation algorithm? So if you are trying to load the extension class loader, the class which is inside an ext folder, even if you try to load this file, first it handovers it to parent. Oh, okay. It says that, okay, uh, Bootstrap, you just look at this file, whether you are able to load this file or not. So if the Bootstrap is unable to load the file, it simply returns a file to the extension class loader. So then extension class loader itself is look for that file and loads that file. It does apply it file is in inside the ext folder. So similarly it works like application class loader if you are trying to load the class from the application class loader every time the bootstrap class loader gets a priority. So it starts from the bootstrap class loader itself and then it will try the extension class loader. If both of these are unable to load the class and they simply return a null. So that's that's how it is delegation algorithm or hierarchy algorithm works. So application class loader loads that uh, loads the class file. This is how it, is, it goes in the loading phase. And the second phase is linking. So basically the linking phase what happens is, so 
I said earlier that the Java is a very secure application. What do you mean by how it is very secure? So, the class file, once you give the class file to class loader subsystem, the loading phase is done and the linking phase, it verifies, uh, verifies the byte code. You compile that, you write the Java program, you download the Java program and you compile it into class file. How? So, the system is, doesn't, the system has to verify whether the byte code is generated properly or not. So, that phase is a very linking phase is, the first phase of linking is divided into three phases, verify, prepare and resolve. So, in the verify phase, it verifies the byte code and ensures that the byte code is properly generated or not. If the verify, if the byte code is not generated properly, then it just simply throws in a verification error. So maybe probably you can test it, write the Java program and once you compile it, it generates a dot class file. Just open the class file and do some verification, save it and then try to run the Java file. So most probably you get a verification error because you modified it other than the file is generated by compiler. So that's how it is, it takes care of it. So it doesn't allow you to put something else into the class file. So that's how it is secured the Java application programming. So in the prepare phase, what is the prepare phase is, uh, I mean, right now it is very difficult for you to understand all these phases, but I just want to give you a brief idea about this uh, JVM architecture. But once we really get into that uh, Java programming language, maybe uh, I will explain you the, with the, class, with the actual Java file. So once you write the Java programming, what happens, in the, how it, it, it runs, uh, how it, it goes to the different uh, these subsystems. So prepare phase is actually in the Java programming language we have all the static variables. In the prepare phase is the static variables memory will be allocated and assigned to the default values. So the third phase is the resolve phase. The resolve phase is all symbolic memory references are replaced with the original references of the memory. So we'll see all these things later on. But just understand that this, this is the Java uh, JVM architecture and these are the phases, there's the three components so, and each class of component has its own phases. The second one is, so during the initialization, this is the third one is initialization. What happens with the initialization is, during the initialization of this, here all the final phase of the class loading. This is the class loading, uh, class loader subsystem, right? This is the initialization of the final phase. During this final phase, all the static variables will be assigned to its original values. Say for example, in the Java program, I defined a uh, variable i equal to 2. But in the uh, prepare and resolve phase, what happens is i will be assigned with the value is a 0. But in the initialization phase, I assigned a 1, right? So the 1 will be assigned back to the variable. So that's how it is happens during the initialization. And not only that, is any, if you write any static blocks, those static blocks will be executed during the initialization. So this is basically the class loader subsystem has three components and three steps. And then the, when you come in, uh, the second component, the subcomponent is runtime data areas. So what exactly is happens during the runtime data areas? The first, again, this uh, runtime data areas is divided into five subcomponents. The first one is method area, and second one is heap area, and the third one is stack area, PC registers, and native method stack. We'll see what exactly the, all these components is. The first one is method area is all the class level data will be stored here. All the class level data will be stored here in this method area. So including the static variables. So this is only one method area for the JVM. Okay. So it's a shared resource. So any thread can share this area. So the second one is, that means uh, shared by uh, multiple threads is, it's not in a thread set. So there is no restriction that only one thread can access at one, once. So a number of threads, if you create in a multiple threads in Java, all threads come and access this method area at once. That means the Java, this method area, is this, this component is not in thread set. So and the second one is heap area. What exactly the heap area is? all the objects and their corresponding instance variables. Say for example, you write a class and you create objects. Once you created objects, an object will have an instance variables and arrays. All the information is stored in the heap area. Just keep it, just keep in mind, that's it. So, so yeah, what you have to remember is, okay, the class objects and instance variables will be stored in the heap area and arrays also. 
So this is also, as I said, is a so just like the mixing layer to method area, this is the only one heap area for JVM. So this is also not thread same. So and the third one is stack area. Stack area is an actually for every thread a runtime stack will be created. So if you look at this uh, picture, we have a three threads: thread one, thread two, and thread three. In this inside the stack area. So each thread has its own stack memory and is thread two as a stack area and thread three also just like a thread n, the stack types. So this thread one, all these all local variables, stack thread. So for every method call, one entry will be made into this stack frame. You see that the bottom of the stack frame is one component. So all the local variables will be stored, stored in this stack memory. The, the stack area is again, if you look at this, is it every thread has its own stack area. That means it's a thread set. So every thread will access its own stack area. It's not uh, interfered with the another uh, thread stack area. So the stack area has its own, and again the stack frame is divided into three sub three areas, three sub components. Like you know, the first one is the stack area is a private as I said that it generates for every uh, runtime stack for every thread, and the local variables will be created. And uh, so if you see this LVA, it's a local variable array. So this is related to method. How many local variables uh, are involved in the corresponding values will be stored here. So the second one is operating stack. Operating stack is any immediate operation. If suppose for example you have a method where it is adding two numbers, one plus two. So it add a, that that's an immediate operation. So it performs an operation and gives an output of that. So this is where it's operating stack. And the frame data is the third one, which is in a symbolic uh, corresponding method is stored here. In case of any exception, while adding two numbers or while adding a subtracting two numbers, something like that, all exceptions will be stored here. So it handles, will be maintained in the frame data. So this is how it is traced. And the next component is, if you look at the PC registers, what exactly the use for the PC registers? Each thread will have its separate PC registers. If you look at this, PC register for thread 1, PC register for thread 2, and PC register for thread A. So similar to the stack area, it's, it has its own different threads in the PC registers. So this PC register actually holds the address of the current execution instructions. So what exactly thread 1 is doing here? So it has its own instructions to execute. So it executes all those instructions. It has all the current instructions executed by different threads. And once it's executed, PC register will be up once if first the first thread is executing. So once it is executed, it's updates and it executes the next execution. And it just keep on going to execute all the n number of threads. So the next one is native method stack. Native method stack holds the native method information. For every thread, a separate native method stack will be created. So first you execute this and it will be converted to the native method stack and native method stack and the thread to native method stack and thread n native method stack. So that's how it goes on. And the third component is execution engine. So engine execution engine, in the last session we discussed about the uh, interpreter and JIT component. But now let us see the uh, in detail. So the first thing is interpreter. Execution in, in the execution subcomponent, the first component is interpreter. So So the execution in what it does is actually the runtime area, the byte will assign to the runtime data area will be executed by this execution engine. So the execution engine reads the byte code and executes it piece by piece. So how it does? So first it is the, the first component it helps, the interpreter helps that. So interpreter interprets the byte codes very faster, but executes very slowly. So the disadvantage of the interpreter is it executes the in, it, uh, interpreter is so for example, when the method is calling called multiple times, every time a new interpretation is required. So it, it interprets fast, but executes slowly. So first executed is called again the same that is called. So it's in the recursive case. So this becomes very slow. The execution of your program becomes very slow. To overcome that disadvantage, so they introduced one more component for JIT compiler. So JIT compiler is a neutralizer the disadvantage of the interpreter. So the execution engine will be using the help of interpreter 
in converting the white code, but when it finds a repeated code, it uses the JIT compiler. The first time it will be, the better is false once, then it is simply use interpreter and interpret the code and runs that. That's fine. But if the same error is keep on calling, then it does, the first time it is interprets and the second time onwards, it simply uses the JIT compiler because JIT compiler is executes the same call first. What it happens is this, com this JIT compiler compiles the entire byte code and changes it into native code. So the native code will be used by directly the repeated method. So as I said that it interprets every time that when the method is keep on calling. So instead of that what happens is that if it defines that okay it's calling keep on calling the same method, it simply converts that you know, white code into the native code. And the second call onwards, any subsequent calls, it uses the native code to execute that method. So that's how it is improves the performance of the method execution. And the third one in the in the execution JIT compiler itself is we have a different components. Intermediate code generator. This is a produce the intermediate code. As I said, that intermediate code is operator and uh, methods code. And then the code optimizer. optimizer. It's responsible for the native code. And the third component is a profiler. So the target code is again generated. Target code is generated. Code optimizer and target code generator is both are. Uh, responsible for the generating machine code and the code optimizer is optimized the code intermediate op it optimizing the intermediate code generated level. So first of what happens is the intermediate code generator generates the intermediate code and code optimizer, optimizer is optimized that code and the target code generator is generates the machine or native code. The last one is profiler. So this profiler is a very special component in the JVM. It's responsible for finding the hot spots. So hotspots is, but how does the JIT compiler know whether the method is calling multiple times? This profiler is takes care of that. It finds that whether the method is called multiple times or not. So that's how it decides whether to use JIT compiler or interpret. If the same method is calling multiple times, then it simply uses JIT compiler. So, but how does this system know whether the method is called? So this profiler is special compiler. It decides, oh, this method is being called for a couple of times, then we should use a JIT compiler instead of interpreter. If you use the interpreter, the execution part becomes slow. And the third, the other component is garbage collector. So garbage collector is once you complete your execution of the program, whatever the object you created becomes an obsolete. So, but once you, if you just keep on leaving that objects just like that, then at once upon it, once the gar uh, the memory will become full. So it won't allow you to put any more objects into the memory. So there is a JVM is handled within a garbage connection. That means whenever the object is no longer in use, so the garbage collection system is a, it's called automatically the JVM calls a garbage collector and it, it cleans all the uh, references that are no longer in use. That's how it maintains the memory very efficiently. So it, it keeps on and it, uh, open the memory for you to put the new things. So you compile 100 programs and you create 100 objects. So if you don't clean all those objects yourself in the Java program, then the garbage collector will take care of that. It runs periodically and it, it just cleans all those objects created by your Java program. And the last one is Java native interface is called as a JNA, which is will be interacting with the native major libraries and provides the native libraries required for the execution. What is the native libraries here? Native libraries in the sense is that operating system libraries. Every program eventually is converted into the OS commands. So that will be executed and written the results. So all these virtual machines. So it converts it to the corresponding underlying operating system. So that's the reason even if you write the Java program in Windows, so this virtual machine is takes cover to whether it converted to the Linux operating system machine code or converted into the Windows machine code or it converts to the Mac operating system. That's how it is the JVM is takes care of it. This is an intermediator in between. The JVM is completely takes care of it. So, but other programs is uh, simply directly compiled into the operating system machine. So, so, if you take a .NET, I mean, if you take other programs like any other programming language, you take it and compile it and run it in Windows. You cannot run the same file on the Linux or other machines. But whereas in Java, you could run it easily. That's how it is provides an advantage over other programming languages. So in the native method library also it's a collection of native libraries. Every operating system is, uh, has, has its own native libraries. So it uses, just like I said the initially, right? 
the Java loads its own jars. And the same way, it has its own library to load that and come, uh, execute the program. So that's how it's basically about Java JVM architecture. But we can discuss one more time this JVM any subsequent sessions like you know. So when we are writing really Java program. So that's how it is JVM architecture.